Hi, Steve Calliff, from Chairman of the Flemington Car and Truck Country family of brands and the Somerset Patriots. As an American citizen, I'm very much interested in honoring veterans who have selflessly served our nation in times of need. One such time was in 1941, when our nation entered a global war which would define the world order for generations to come. Ordinary citizens, many of which were just 17 years old, were called into service. Archie Fagan was one of those ordinary young citizens. Many of us know Archie as an energetic presence at ShopRite in Flemington, where he greets customers and enthusiastically promotes the specials of the day. However, a few of us know Archie as a World War II veteran who became a first-hand witness to some of the most important events of the 20th century. As a member of General Patton's 3rd Army, 4th Armored Division, 66th Tank Battalion, his unit broke the siege of the town of Bastogne in the Battle of the Bulge in December 1944. Archie also bore witness to the atrocities committed by the Nazis at Dachau concentration camp in southern Germany merely three weeks after it was liberated by American troops. As a soldier in the American occupation forces based in Munich, Archie was an observer at the Nuremberg war trials where top Nazi officers were tried for war crimes. Archie is interviewed by Pete Higley, a Boy Scout in Troop 1969, based in Reddington, New Jersey. Pete is working on his Eagle Project, where he's recording interviews for local World War II veterans for both the Armed Forces Heritage Museum and the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Archie Fagan is truly an ordinary citizen who led in an extraordinary life. Please join me in enjoying this inspirational story. All right, so let's begin by talking a little bit about your family. Um, so where and when were you born? Uh, I was born in Philadelphia, uh, February the 8th, 1927. What about your parents? Uh, they were Jewish immigrants that migrated to this country in 1898 as children to escape the tyranny of uh, Tsarist Russia, and they ran a small a retail store in Philadelphia. And what about your siblings? Uh, I am one of uh, eight siblings. I was number six. And what was it like growing up during the Depression? Uh, well, that was uh, very painful. Prohibition was still in force. People were in red lines. You had 25% unemployment. And the government was, uh, was trying to set up uh, programs uh, to feed the poor and the homeless. Uh, my mother and father couldn't take care of me because the number of seven child and so they they farmed me out to my mother mother's parents who raised me during that time during the depression. And uh, what sort of role did religion play in your? Well, I was brought up with a Jewish education, not formal, but uh, a home for which we were taught uh, dietary laws good deeds and also charity, yes. Uh, and did you have a job growing up? I carried delivered orders for my mother's and father's grocery store. I had a little wagon. I remember delivering orders to the speakeasies then, which was, prohibition was still in force in 1932. I worked uh, as a teenager in the drugstore uh, for 25 cents an hour. Yes, I was always had a job and work. Uh, and do you remember any sort of discussion around the house or in the di around the dinner table regarding the situation in Europe? My father was an avid reader. He read the Jewish papers before it at that time. And uh, they did recount much of the anti-Semitism that was going on under Hitler's uh, regime after he took over in 1932 as he became a chancellor. Uh, there were there were reports of coming through, but it was not emphasized by the American press or media. We had to learn it through the newspapers, the Jewish newspapers. Mm. And uh, do you remember the attack on Pearl Harbor? Very vividly, yes. Uh, I was in my early teens. It was Sunday, December the 7th, 1944. One, the Japanese committed that day of infamy in which they almost completely destroyed the American fleet. And we did, and we knew 
that uh, we were going to war. After the president declared war on Japan and Hitler's Germany declared war on the United States, how did your life change? Well, it changed dramatically. We went on a full wartime basis. We were told to conserve. We were issued later on ration books to buy food. And uh, my brother uh, was drafted when he became uh, what his number was called up. So. Uh, and you graduated from high school in 1944. So yes. how soon after that were you drafted? About a, a month after I graduated, I received a letter from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It said that the greetings report for induction to your local draft board. You're now, uh, uh, you're now completely drafted. I was thrown into the to defend, to support and, uh, the Constitution. And I was queried whether they wanted, what branch I wanted to go into. I said, I would love to go into the Navy, but they told me, soldier, you're in the Army now. We were put on trains and sent to Camp Wheeler, Georgia in June, late June of 1944, where I took 16 weeks of basic training came from young boys in civilian life as children and we were turned into men in 16 weeks. We were, we marched in all kinds of weather. We went, went under fire, under barbed wire. We were giving intense training for the war. And where did you go after Camp Wheeler? Uh, I was given a, a seven days furlough before I had to report to Camp Pickett, Virginia for overseas duty, where we went over in convoy, took us seven days to sub infested waters to get to Lahar, France. We landed in December of 1944. The early invasion was in Normandy. We landed further down the coast at La Havre, which was a major port, but it was bombed out. And, uh, we were given the job of guarding uh, German prisoners that were captured during the invasion six months earlier. That was my first introduction of meeting the German Wehrmacht, but they were prisoners then with the POW shirts on them, and we guarded them until we got orders to move up to the front. Uh, several days or maybe a week after we landed, we were put on French train that took us to Paris. From Paris, they, we were fed by the French, and then we debarked, and we had to march 24 hours, just for short breaks, up to the Belgian border. And what do you remember about the city of Paris? Very little. We, uh, we didn't see Paris was under blackout. It was the major city that uh, the Germans had taken over and captured. It was a captured city, had lost all its city of lights. We were only being fed at the, at the range train station there by French women that uh, they didn't look at us as liberators. They looked at us at, uh, as late to the game. They looked like they were uh, bedraggled and abused, but they fed us from the canteens there so that we would have, leave, have food to march up to the Belgian border. What was the morale on this march from Paris to Belgium? We, we young soldiers of 17, uh, we didn't know what would lay ahead of us. Uh, we didn't feel fear, we just feel the anxiety and we, we, we felt the harsh orders of our superiors that prepare ourselves, but we were given warm clothing, we were given uh, uh, underwear and overcoats and mufflers and gloves so that we would be prepared for the harsh winter that, that, that arrived us at the front. And once you reached Belgium, Belgium what happened? Since I spoke Yiddish fluently and Jewish Yiddish is a combination of Hebrew and German, I was transferred over to G2, which was Army Intelligence, and I was given the job of interrogating young 
German prisoners that I would try to get information from them. And we were given cigarettes, candy to give to them, to, to bribe them to get information, and it worked. We found that kindness and mercy sometimes gets more than harshness, that you get more with honey than you get with vinegar. It gave us the information to turn the Germans back who were not only running out of ammunition, but were so spread out that they had to pull back because reinforcers, we were coming up with reinforcements to drive them back. Um, and and what was it like um, inter interrogating these prisoners? What were their mental uh, condition? Well, they were as afraid as we were. Many of them were part of the Jungen, the German Jungen youth movement, and they were captured and they were hungry and cold just like we were. And they were afraid, they saw the goodies that we gave them and they were willing to give us information because they were tired of the war as we were getting ready for the war to drive them back. And what sort of information were you trying to get at? Well, we, we got information that they were running out of food and fuel, that they were spread out, that they lacked communication with their superiors. And the Germans had one disadvantage that we found out later that any news, any strategy they used, they had to get from Berlin, from their high command, the OKW, as they called it. They waited for Hitler to give them the information and the orders. Where the army was more decentralized, in which we gave the, the impetus and the motivation to the, our local commanders. That's why we succeeded at at Bastogne at the Battle of the, in the Ardennes Forest, yes. And what was, what was your role in the, um, in the Bastogne um, situation? Well, I first was a interrogator, but once we started to push them back, and the 4th Armored Division, which I was assigned to, the 66th Tank Battalion, was the first to enter Bastogne and relieve the, relieve the siege there of the 101st Airborne that was in terribly bad shape. I remember them. They had suffered from trench foot, from sickness, from lack of food, and they they were glad to see us, but they, they did give us the welcome that we deserved re relieving them and saving them. They're a very uh, tough gang, that 101st Airborne. They're a tough gang. And uh, there was a certain amount of competitive, but if history records it, and as I witness as a, as a witness there, we saved those guys. So Nazi Germany, Germany's military force was divided between the regular army, or the Wehrmacht, yep. and the SS. And the SS army played a large role in the German breakthrough during the winter of 1944. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us about the the SS massacre at Malmedy. Yes. Well, uh, if I can recall, the Germans in their breakthrough, Hitler had used his best divisions, and most of his best divisions were the SS. They had the SS on, uh, on, their, on their collars, SS on their helmets. Hitler had used his real crack troops to break through, because that's his last attempt to divide the Americans from the British to get to the port of Antwerp, which was our major port of supplies. He had a major general by the name of Dietrich, uh, and he was in charge of a, the leading tank, and he had also a couple of lieutenants. These were SS men, were part of his crack troops that were the initial men that broke through. He also had used German soldiers who spoke fluent English to deceive the Americans there, to turn some of the signs around, and to kill some of our troops. They used every conceivable weapon to, to gain access to the Meuse River and to the and to enter, but they failed because as they ran out of gas and as we came up with further uh, reinforcements, uh, actually we were told the generals were truly worried 
pattern of its force to work would send us up overnight without any rest up to the front to push, to push the SS back. The SS are the cruelest of, of the German troops. We learned in the war that as the Wehrmacht went forward, in later wars in Russia and in France, they were followed by the SS killing squads, the Erstbox killers. And they would kill all the partisans and the Jews that they found as they followed the Wehrmacht. But in the Battle of the Bulge, the SS was up front to make the, 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 the Germany breakthrough, which they failed because of the resilience and the courage and the fighting spirit of the American fighting man. And what happened to uh, U.S. prisoners taken by the SS? The Germans who initially broke through captured a number of American prisoners, maybe maybe five to 10,000, yes, and had to surrender because they were surrounded. But they put up a fight, many were killed, and so they were ca captured and hounded and taken over to Malmody, which was near Bastogne and San Vies in the Ardennes. And ladies and gentlemen, there's where a tragedy and a horror and the, the articles of war were not observed. The Germans turned their machine guns on our captured Americans and slaughtered them. Yes. So we, when the news trickled down to us who are still fighting in the field, we were told, gentlemen, if you're Jewish, because our door tag said he ate on there, throw them away if captured. We were given orders to take no prisoners. That's what the, the result of Malbody. It is to be remembered this day that our men who had to give up were slaughtered because they couldn't defend themselves. After Roosevelt died, our president, our revered president, he died of a stroke in April the 12th, as I remember, in 1945. Harry Truman, the vice president, ascended to the presidency, and he was in a, he conferred with Churchill who was the British Prime Minister, and Joseph Stalin, who was the Russian counterpart there, that the Russians needed revenge. And the deal was made at Yalta, where they met on the Black Sea, that uh, we Americans were not to go into Berlin, we were to leave it to the Russians, because, ladies and gentlemen, in the truth, the facts show that the Russians of the Allies and the participants in the war lost the most people, both military and civilian, of around 50 million, yes. So they needed to get into Berlin to show Hitler what the Russians were going to do. And so we were ordered to go southeast. Do you recall crossing the Rhine and entering Germany? We yes. March up. Uh, we found out that the Germans made a terrible mistake by not blowing up the bridge at Remagen over the Rhine River, which was Bastogne, the Ardennes, which was near, and that's where we crossed, we crossed the Rhine River at Remagen. We were, we were proceeding. The Germans were falling back. And what was the significance of crossing the Remagen? That was a morale booster. In fact, the news got back that that George Patton, who was head of the 4th Armored Division, he wanted to show his victory and his ego that he urinated into the Rhine River as we crossed it at Remonton. And uh, describe what the German countryside and the towns looked like. Uh, if you go to Germany today, you will never visualize the destruction that we saw 73 years ago. Our bombers and the Germ British liberate uh, Lancasters, they pulverized Germany to smithereens. No, at this point, were the Germans still putting up a fight in the war? Yes. The Germans were defending their motherland. Don't forget, uh, the Germans were falling back, 
but they did have the Ziegfeld line. They did have the, the Rhine River that they used as, as defense uh, barriers. News came back that they were, they were asking for an armistice or some terms for surrender. But under the altered agreement between Roosevelt and Truman and uh, Churchill and Stalin, that there was nothing short of unconditional surrender. And when the Germans realized that they that mass divisions were surrendering as we were getting, going further east into the German heartland, they surrendered. Admiral Donitz, who was then commander of the German army because the other generals had fled, uh, he, he, he asked for peace. It was around May the 5th of 1945 that the Germans surrendered unconditionally. What was your experience um, uh, with uh, Dachau and the German concentration camp? That was one of my painful, if you would ask me one of my po most painful and tearful experiences of my life, keep in mind I was only 17 and a half, uh, 10 miles before we got to Dachau, we smelled the stench. It was to this day, it's still in my mind. I wake up during the night, my wife wants to know why I have nightmares. I can smell smell the stench of death at Dachau. When we got there, the German guards had fled or they were beaten to death by men. Some of the uh, inmates were still able to fight, but there were emaciated living skeletons that were so happy, they they cried with joy and got down and kissed our feet and our hands. If you can visualize scarecrows uh, in tattered clothes, men that with sunken eyeballs, men with sunken faces, men with protruding bones, with men disease and maggots all over them, that is the picture of Dachau. But we brought up supplies. We were told not to give them too much food because they would die. For, their stomachs were already contracted. So we gave them water and medicine to try to keep them alive. But if you can envision decimation, uh, degradation, if you can visualize human inhumanity, indignity, human cruelty, you can visualize Dachau. And do you speak with any of these former Yes, uh, I spoke Yiddish, and uh, they showed me the tattoos they had on their wrist. Uh, Hitler wanted to reduce them to cattle because all the cattle were, were tattooed to identify cattle. I talked to most of them, and I can say most of them were, they were jubilant. Uh, Many of them I spoke German or Yiddish to wanted to go to Israel. They did not want to come to America. So that was what I found out. But we stayed a very short time. We had to keep moving. It was not a pretty sight. And where did you move on from from there? From that there on, I, I, I had a small group. We were taken by uh, half tracks down to uh, down to Munich. What was life like in Munich at this time? Well, life was pretty good. I lived in a section, I had my own apartment, and I was told later it was near the home of Eva, uh, Hitler's mistress. Did German civilians work for the Army of Occupation? George Patton, our head of the 4th Armored Division, became the managing governor of Bavaria. And so he he, he followed the strategy of enlisting even former Nazis to help him to rejuvenate Germany, to bring it back, because he was terribly afraid of Russian communism that was be, be taking over Eastern Europe at that time. Did you take any excursions while in Munich? I took the trips to German Alps, and I learned how to ski there, treated royally, and later on, we took a trip to Berchtesgaden, which was Hitler's eagle's nest, right near the Austrian border. 
and uh, we were given plenty of food. We were really treated great. So we did take several excursions. And uh, how did you come upon the opportunity of um, appearing in the, or of witnessing the Nuremberg trials? And the colonel came to me to ask me if I would like to go up to Nuremberg. The Nuremberg trials were in progress. If I would go as a military observer. Uh, I acceded, I said, thank you, Colonel, I would like to go. And so we were accepted by the, the, uh, the, the military police. They wore white helmets as, uh, as visitors, to, as military observers. And we were giving uh, quarters and taken over to the Palace of Justice two days. I was there in September. We sat up in the, in the gallery with earphones, and the Russian prosecutor, I remember, was talking about the about the inhumanity and the persecution and the damage that the Nazis had done on his people. And so that was going on and we had interpreters there and as I looked down uh, I could see Goring, Hess, Von Ribbentrop, Keitel, Yodel, Von Poppen, Ersch, First, Kaltenbrunner, uh, uh, the German man who ran uh, the Der Stummer, the German propaganda machine. Uh, his, his name uh, escapes me right now. But these were all, Admiral Donitz was there who capitulated. They were all there. I saw every one of them, and behind each one of them was an American military police guarding them. And this was the array of the German Nazi prisoners that I saw firsthand in September of 1946. And where did you go after this? Well, I was there for two days and then we had to go back. And I reported to the colonel in, in Munich. And that was September of 1946. And he asked me if I wanted to stay longer as with a, with a promotion, and I told him, uh, Colonel, thank you, if I remember clearly, that I wanted to go home, to go to college. I was not born to be a, a career soldier. And so the ship that took me home was a General Harry Taylor. It was a new Liberty ship. It left the end of December of 1946. It took, uh, the North Atlantic was very turbulent at the time, I remember. I was seasick all the way home. But when I saw the Statue of Liberty and the lights of, of, of New York, I got God and cried, ladies and gentlemen. You have no idea how beautiful America looks when you've seen the desolation of war for almost two years. Ladies and gentlemen, pray for peace because war is a dirty evil. It's man's inhumanity to man and many millions were born after enduring. Pray for peace. Um, and I would just like to thank you for sharing your story today. And it has been an honor to interview you. Yes. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your service as well. So thank you very much. Pete, can I thank you for having me? Yes. And please forgive me if I became melodramatic. Please forgive me. It brings back memories, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tender, sensitive person. Thank you for thank having me. Thank you very me. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.